So, continuing onward from an example we did last Thursday, I, I forget exactly what it was, but it was something like, you know, n squared minus n over n times two, oh, zoom, n times two to the n plus n minus one. It was something like that. And we used the, um, the limit comparison test, and we ended up, um, we compared it to two to the n, and the limit we ended up with was zero. And first of all, I'm like 99% sure that that was just an error somewhere in the mess of L'Hopital's rule and taking derivatives. Um, because when I went to Desmos and tried to recreate the problem, I kept getting the limits I had expected to get on Thursday, which was one. So I'm pretty sure I made a mistake somewhere in that problem. But let's assume for the second that everything was fine. that I did this test and I got um, zero. So on Thursday, I kind of stuttered through this because I wasn't expecting it. But then I said, well, the test isn't actually failing here. And we'll talk about that Monday next week. So here we are talking about this. And I'm now going to slightly extend the limit comparison test. The limit comparison test says that if you take the limit as n goes to infinity, it only works with positive numbers, of the ratio of the terms of a series and it's finite and also it's greater than zero, then a sub n and b sub n either both converge or they both diverge. Now here, I don't remember it well. I have this, oh, first of all, that was a typo. I, uh, I have this hideous kind of idea that the reason I got zero on Thursday was just because I totally forgot 
to do with a division and just took the limit of that uh, top fraction. But either way, suppose we uh, suppose we do get zero, then well, then we are not in this case. There's a second case, as it happens, that would uh, cover this if the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n over b sub n equals zero and The B sub N series converges, then the A sub N series converges. So the first bullet point I have on the board is the main limit comparison test. I mean, in like 99 times out of 100, probably, when I use the limit comparison test, I end up with a limit of one. And we're in this top case. It's a finite positive number. But if we do get zero, that might tell us something. It also might not tell us something. Um, because you see the second case is weaker than the first case. The first case can tell you that the series converges. It can tell you that the series diverges. The second case only works if we're doing the comparison with a convergent series. And the reason I said on Thursday, well, we could still use the limit comparison test is that that's exactly the case we have here. Um, this limit is zero. but one over two to the n converges. So this series converges. And the intuition, it's, it's always good to have some kind of intuition. Um, sometimes I think well, sometimes I think we're very bad at that. The intuition here is we've got a fraction and the fraction is getting small. What's it mean for a fraction to be small? Well, something like one, 100 or two over, one million and three, a fraction is small if the top is much smaller than the bottom. So now if we're looking at series, and the bottom is finite, the bottom converges. Well, if this limit is, if this fraction is small, if it's close to zero, the top has to be smaller than the bottom. So for the top to be smaller than a finite number, the top also has to be finite. And there's sort of your intuition. And we haven't seen this case and we probably won't, but um, there is some remaining case.
Let me try to think of this. Um, if the limit is zero and if the limit is infinity, sorry, and B sub N diverges the top also diverges. And again, our intuition is, I mean, it's sort of the opposite of the intuition we have here. What's it mean for a fraction to be a real V B? What's it mean for a fraction to go to infinity? Well, it means the top is bigger than the bottom. Well, if the bottom is diverging, if the bottom is going to infinity, then for the top to be bigger than infinity, the top also has to be infinity. Yeah. <laughs> so I actually, I don't always um, sort of bother mentioning the other two cases because the one I circled is the one that actually matters, or I shouldn't say that, but it's the one that matters in the majority of cases. But since, um, since one of the other cases happened to sort of come up in an example, I figured I'd better go through them real quick. <laughs> And that brings us to the end of this section. Um, the limit comparison test I do like. I do think it's important. We've sort of discussed my, my reservations about the regular comparison test. I won't repeat those. But the next test is the really important one. The next test is the one that gets used nine times out of 10 in sort of concrete and applied situations. And that's the ratio test. I'm not going to jump right into the ratio test though. <laughs> Because when you see the ratio test on the board, it's going to have some absolute values in it. And therefore, before we talk about the ratio test, we should talk about absolute values and what those are doing in the context of the ratio test. Definition. A series A sub N is said to converge absolutely. If the sum of the absolute values converges. And um, in English, the word absolute to be is sort of adding emphasis, right? You, you can't be an absolute monarch if you aren't some kind of monarch. So 
that uh, that passes through here, a series that converges absolutely also converges in the regular sense. <laughs> <clears throat> so, a few comments. First of all, this gives us a way of sometimes using the previous tests if, um, even if the terms are not all positive. Like, think back. To this test. With this test, I said, well, the, um, this test being the limit comparison test, I said, well, the terms all have to be positive. Um, so if we gave you negative one to the n times n over n cubed plus four, for example. Um, it, it might, that negative one to the n, it, let's say we're starting at one. Um, that negative one to the n is going to cause some of these terms to be positive and some of them to be negative because negative one to the first power is negative. Negative one to the second power is positive. Negative one to the third power is negative, and so on. And this might seem like the kind of thing that, that math professors just to do to be difficult, but actually, you know, going back to what I said about factorials, a lot of our most important series are going to have exactly that negative one to the n in them. So we can't use we can't use the limit comparison test because some of these terms are negative. And that's a shame because <clears throat> I have a very strong intuition about what this series is doing. If we ignored the negative one to the n for a moment and just looked at that, do you figure that series converges or diverges? Probably converges. Converges. I agree. I mean, the point here, we don't always bother writing that infinity, but maybe we should, because the point here is that n is getting really big. And like, so you have a billion over a billion cubed plus four. A trillion over a trillion cubed plus four. And as n is getting bigger and bigger, that plus four is becoming more and more irrelevant. Like, the, the difference between one and two is more important than the difference between a billion and a billion and one is the intuition we should have. And n over n cubed is one over n squared, which is a convergent piece. 
effects. So it's a shame about that negative one, because if it, <laughs> if it weren't for it, I would have a very clear line of attack on this problem. Well, now that we've seen the idea of absolute convergence, I can thank you, Zoom, just a little more sensitive than I need you to be. I can say that if the absolute value of this converges, then the series we're actually asking about converges. <laughs> And as it happens, <clears throat> so what taking the absolute value does <clears throat> when we've got this negative one to the n term is it just totally removes the negative one to the n. And other than that, everything's positive and the absolute value doesn't do anything. And I don't want to uh, dwell on this problem, but it is indeed the case that the limit comparison test works here. This limit is one, so the limit comparison test says that if um, one over n squared converges, so does n over n cubed plus four. So this does converge. So, this series we're asking about does converge. Um, there are limits to this strategy. The main limit is that we don't have anything called like absolute divergence. If the absolute values diverge, that doesn't tell us anything about the original series. Like, you're going to kind of have to take my word for some of the stuff I'll say on this frame until we've had a chance to look at the alternating series test. But, um... Negative one to the n times one over n. The so called alternating harmonic series. Because these terms are alternating between being positive and being negative. None of the tests we have work. The tests we have all require that the terms all be positive. So we can try the same thing we tried on the last frame, which is Well, what, what if we put absolute values there? 
And unfortunately, the answer to that question is that if we put absolute values there, the series diverges. And this does not give us any information. Um, I mean, this is the part of the frame that you'll just have to take my word on for the moment. But in fact, the alternating harmonic series is a convergent series. So it doesn't converge absolutely. But it does converge. So um, this sort of method of using the integral test or the limit comparison test or the comparison test is really quite stunted because all of those tests can tell you in the ordinary course of things whether a series converges or diverges. If we take the absolute value, we can no longer show divergence, and we can't always show convergence. Still, um, the reason we want to, the reason we're sort of talking about this is the next test we talk about, the ratio test, is an absolute convergence test. It has the absolute values built right into it. Um, absolute convergence is quite a nice property. This is the kind of thing that we don't really have a chance to go to go into in depth in the calculus to. But absolute series, absolutely convergent series are nice because we can work with them the way we work with finite sums, which we can't ordinarily do. Um, Like, there's no real reason that you should remember all of these details. But we looked at Grandy's series. And Grandy's series is weird. It was very interesting to Grandy because he noticed that if you rewrite this series and sort of very normal ways, you can make it equal different sums. So Grandy noticed that if you put these parentheses in, this ought to equal zero because you're adding zero plus zero plus zero plus zero plus zero an infinite number of times. On the other hand, he observed that you can rewrite the series like this, and this ought to be a one, because you're starting with one, but all of the other terms, all of those terms that we're subtracting are zero. And Grandy was like, well, and then later mathematicians was like, well, this is this is strange, this is interesting, because nothing like this can happen when you have um, 
finite sums. If you have finite sums and you want to throw parentheses in, or you want to rewrite things a little, you know, you'll always end up with the same result. Those parentheses don't matter, but infinite series you can't work with that way. So in modern um, terms, I, um, I lament the tendency of, of, you know, science um, historians and math historians to sometimes talk about, about their predecessors as if they were morons. I mean, the reason Grandy didn't have the results that we have now is that centuries of mathematics went on between Grandy and the definition of the limit. But anyway, a modern mathematician wouldn't struggle with this. A modern mathematician would say, oh, well, it's an infinite sum. You can't rearrange terms of infinite sums. You can't throw parentheses into infinite sums. Unless the infinite sum happens to converge absolutely. If, if an infinite series converges absolutely, you can rearrange the terms, you can add parentheses, you can do all of the things you could do with regular addition. And again, this isn't this isn't history of math, but trying to put this into some kind of historical context. Um, when people started working with infinite series, um, the infinite series they thought were important, the ones they wanted to work with, all were absolute be convergent. So they were doing stuff with this series that a modern mathematician would be like, hold on, you can't, you can't put parentheses there, you can't do the stuff you're doing. But they were getting the same results that a modern mathematician would get thanks to the fact that we can do these things to absolutely convergent series. And then I mentioned that Grandy's series was kind of like a, a source of dispute. Nobody knew what to do with Grandy's series because the exact same stuff that they were doing to their other series was causing these freak results when they did them with Grandy's. Well, that's all kind of a side note. We're not in this class going to be, um, I think, adding parentheses or rearranging a bunch of terms. The, the real significant thing you should know is you, that you should know the definition and then you should know this result that if a series converges absolutely it converges in the normal way and now that we've seen absolute convergence Nothing in the ratio test ought to be really surprising to us. Um, so the ratio test is a lot like the limit comparison test. Um, in the sense that we're going to take a limit of a fraction and we're going to see what happens to it. So the ratio test 
I'll put it on the board. The ratio tests for a series has the lovely property of being completely mechanical. You don't have to have any intuition. You don't have to do anything clever. It's just a machine that you hit the series with. In particular, you take the limit as n goes to infinity of the ratio of a sub n plus one divided by a sub n. So this is going to be some number. I mean, it could just not exist. It could, but, but let's assume for a moment that this limit does exist. If this limit is between zero and one, the series converges. In fact, it converges absolutely. It has a very strong convergence. If the limit is greater than one, the series diverges. And now for all of the um little for all of the tests I've done before, I've written, you know, this little, little list of pros and cons. Here comes the great con of the ratio test. The limit can equal one. And if the limit equals one, the test fails. And because the ratio test is so mechanical. If the test fails, there's nothing you can do to fix it. Like if, if, if you're doing the comparison test and you try something and it fails, you can go back and try a different comparison. You can try to fix things. With the um, limit comparison test, same thing. If the limit comparison test fails, maybe you can try again and do a different comparison. Here, if the test fails, the test fails, and there's nothing that can be done about it. And um, I mean, when you see this on the board, it might seem like failure is sort of a freak condition, because the limit could be any one of an infinity of numbers, and it only fails in one specific case. But it's quite easy to find, you know, very elementary examples where the limit, where the ratio test, sorry, doesn't work. Like, it fails with the harmonic series, just to to give a quick example. How did you know to put the plus one below the? Right. So 
That's a good question. And, and we'll be doing a bunch of examples with this tomorrow, but you've got a sub n plus one. Oh, I see it. Was... A sub n and a sub n plus one is going to be the series term, but you're going to replace all the n's with n plus ones. So a sub n, I mean, I see you nodding, but just for like, online students or anyone playing on home, playing along at home. A sub n is one over n, a sub n plus one, that n gets replaced with an n plus one. So that's, That's the main con. If I wanted to create a list of pros and cons, that it can fail. You know, if we'll have to do something else for for this series although of course we already did we can use the integral test to determine that it diverges pros well it's it's totally mechanical I mean, that's not to say that you don't have to work for it and that you don't have to think, because of course you do. But um, you don't have to go into this with any intuition. You, you can um, find a sub n plus one just by replacing the n's with n plus ones. You can look at the fraction, you can take the limit, and what happens, happens. No, um, this is something that a computer could do with no input from a human being. And this is a little more abstract, It works very well with, well, I guess it's not that abstract. Um, it works really well with factorials and power. Um, so factorials, I've mentioned they show up in a lot of important applications, but none of the tests we've seen really work great with them. I mean, the integral test just totally fails. And then the problem with the limit comparison test and the comparison test is that we probably have very little intuition regarding factorials. So tests that require a lot of intuition are going to be hard. Um, this test, by contrast, is going to work really well. And we'll, I mean, we'll, as I say, tomorrow will be a big example day. Um, in the four minutes we have left, some intuition. Why is the ratio test the way it is? Why does it work? And I mean, the short answer that better be short with four minutes, but the ratio test is based off the geometric series. 
Remember the geometric series. Look like that. I mean, we we usually start, we can start them at zero, or we can put an n minus one there, but that's let's say this is a geometric series. Um, if we apply If we look at this ratio for geometric series, we wind up with R. And we know that if the ratio is less than one, it converges. If the ratio is greater than or equal to one, it diverges. So this is true for geometric series. And the ratio test is taking this and it's saying, OK, we have some series. What if instead of just looking at the ratio, we looked at the limit? of the ratio. We have basically exactly the same thing. The only difference is that R being greater than or equal to one splits off into two cases. If R is greater than one, this still diverges. If R equals one, the ratio test fails. All right, and that brings us to 9.15. I will see you all right under the tomorrow.